my name is Daisy Coppolo. I'll be I'll be your uh, presenter this afternoon, covering transformational leadership, looking at how we can maintain competitiveness in the global um, workplace. Now, just as we start, just a few housekeeping um, issues. I'm joined by uh, four panelists here. I have Francis Mateo, who's in the background. He's going to be uh, he's going to be supporting me and uh, Nancy as well, Nancy and Conde. I think I have Marisol as well in the in the background. Just so you know, we are going to have time for questions and answers later on in the session. Uh, but in the meantime, if you can just make a note of those questions and answers, we'll run straight through the presentation and we'll then handle the questions um, at the end of the presentation. As you type them in, uh, my panelists are going to be taking the questions, so nothing's going to get lost along the way. And so, um, as people join us, it's, it's time. It's time for our presentation, so we're going to be starting right away. So, for, for the purpose of the agenda, um, this is what we're going to be looking at this afternoon. We're going to be covering um, transformational leadership. We're going to cover a brief, what is it we're talking about. Then we're going to move to the lessons that we get from a VUCA world, and for those that don't know what VUCA means, we're going to, as we get to that point in the presentation, we're going to address that. We then are going to look at how we move to achieving a competitive edge. And lastly, how we embrace transformation. Um, before we launch into the presentation, just a, just a few uh, background thoughts. And that is that we're looking at the transformational leadership, you know, particularly through the lens of what the whole globe has been through, um, the COVID-19 pandemic. Why we're using that as a backdrop is that I think at no other time, certainly not in this generation, has the whole globe been beleaguered with a pandemic that has changed the whole way in which we operate, not just at national economy level, but at organizational level, with corporate level, and in a lot of ways, uh, from, a, from, a, from a personal uh, perspective, personal paradigm, it's completely changed the way in which we do things. So it's a good backdrop in which, uh, against which to examine transformational leadership. The other thing is that we haven't actually come out of it completely yet. So it's a work in progress. We're still learning as we go along. There's no complete book of, of available at the moment um, that can talk about what to do um, and how to respond in a COVID-like pandemic the lessons are still being learned. But there's some standard things that we can learn from you know, the complexity of the world that we live in anyway. And some of these lessons are what we're going to be looking at today. My screen has frozen. So we're just trying to get a technical hit sorted here. So please bear with me one minute. Uh, there we go. So, uh, transformational leadership, in brief. The key word here is transformational. And transformation isn't something that happens in, you know, necessarily in short spurts. For the purpose of this conversation, we're looking at how we motivate and influence individuals and corporate assistance in order to achieve superior results. This is about keeping organizational dynamism. And we do that by having visionary leadership 
And what is this visionary leadership designed to do? One of the things that we're learning through this whole process is entrenching a future consciousness. And we're going to look at how we're going to do that. We're also going to look at how transformation requires very deliberate, very preemptive and disruptive thinking. It's not something that happens you know, by default. It's, it doesn't, transformation doesn't organize itself by itself. It's something that leaders have to purposefully uh, um, craft within their corporate uh, strategies. The one thing that's, that I think the whole globe has experienced is uncertainty. And we're going to look at how we develop a capability for uncertainty. And finally, transformation is really about organization sustainability at the end of the day. If we do not achieve organizational sustainability, um, then the likelihood is that we see many, many, many more corporates um, going into demise. And that's the thing that we need to try and stem. So why, why transformational leadership? Why can't it be any other kind of leadership? Because we recognize that actually volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity seems to now be the new normal. If you look at what we've been experiencing um, at a global level in terms of pandemic, many of the solutions that have been found to how you know, corporates work, how economies work, how individuals work, it's become you know, something that we learn as we go along. Like I indicated earlier, there doesn't seem to be a script that could have prepared us for the upheaval um, of, of COVID. What seemed like a pandemic that was concentrated in the East, in China, very quickly became domesticated and very quickly you know, disrupted every manner of economic system. The other reason why we're looking at transformational leadership is actually uncertainty can be handled strategically. But if you recall in the last slide, we talked about how we need to be deliberate and how to be preemptive. The next thing is that we need to recognize that if we're looking at developing a competitive edge and corporates, not just corporate survival, but corporate sustainability, we need to apply duality of strategy. So there's protectionism, protecting what we've already built up to now, and then secondly, there's launching into this uncertain future and that will require risk taking. So without letting go of what we've already achieved, we've got to protect that and we've then got to look at how is it going to change? How do we then you know, continue to grow businesses, make strategic decisions and achieve corporate success by taking risks in this uncertain environment? So, the only way we can do this is look, take, you know, take some introspection, look back at what's happened in this VUCA world, in this volatile, uncertain, complex, and the biggest world that seems to have become the new normal and has left us feeling, you know, a little bit like this, very confused, unsure, disoriented, bewildered. And what's also happened is that, you know, leaders, you know, of organizations may actually begin to feel a little bit inadequate because they haven't had to handle this level of complexity, this level of ambiguity. Um, so leaders are having to take stock and say, what is it that's going to give us the, you know, the balance, the equilibrium that we had before? Restore the sense of confidence in the corporate strategies, in the corporate future that they'd envisaged. So there's some internal lessons, there's some external lessons, and we're also going to look at some opportunities that COVID has, uh, has taught us. Let's look at the internal lessons. I think the internal lessons, the first thing is we have a weak capability for uncertainty. It's not something, it's a script that remains unwritten. And basically because strategies, corporate strategies are designed around what we do know. We know how, um, you know, our tax regimes work. We know how we respond to economic budgets. 
we know how we've responded to stakeholder uh, and relationship management strategies and how we've trained our employees. But COVID has thrown in some curveballs and made a lot of this uncertain. And this uncertainty has therefore highlighted where the organizational fault lines are. And some of the, those are that we have had rigid structures. We've had a way of working within brick and mortar, within shared spaces, where staff come in at eight and leave at, at, and leave at, at, at five. We know how to monitor uh, employee performance as we sit across the desk from our employees. It's also raised organizational fault lines around cultures, the culture that we have within a corporate workspace and the relationships that we build around them. The other thing that's become quite evident is our dependency on a known market segment and customer. And this has led us to um, concentration risks, putting our eggs into the one market and the one clientele um, niche that we've understood so well. And somehow this hasn't served us very, very well um, or perfectly. Uh, lucky are those organizations that have had a blended, a blended operating environment in which they've understood how to work directly with customers face to face, as well as have a technology based solution for, for, for their customers. Now, for because we're in Africa, we also know that not all of our customers can engage with us um, using technology. And that risk, that weakness has certainly showed up, you know, during this period. Because as we've closed offices, closed businesses in order to keep, you know, staff safe and keep customers safe, it's also resulted in our inability to serve the, the, the customer base that we currently have. And this, this next point, the weak customer and stakeholder connectedness speaks very much to the previous point. And that is that when we haven't been able to serve our customers face to face, the connectedness has been broken. And later on, we'll look at how can we change that? How can we keep connected with our stakeholders and our customers, uh, regardless of the, the business model that we adopt? Internally, it's become very, very clear that the staff complement that we have has sometimes been trained only for operating within a shared you know, workspace. The face-to-face -face, um, uh, face -face, uh, uh, workspaces. It's also challenged the way we onboard staff members. We've onboarded them traditionally through face-to-face -face interviews and giving them the um, giving them the, uh, the, the, the period in which we monitor whether in fact they're a perfect fit um, before we give them the permanent contract. That has been done by being able to see how they work, see, how, see their reports physically, see how they interact with other staff members in the workspace. Do they fit into our culture? Do they not fit into our culture? And the same applies to the extension strategy. Wellness and productivity. Um, again, even in a good time, um, wellness and productivity have not always been linked. We've, a lot of companies, um, and it's, this is not just in Zambia, this is not just in Africa, but a lot of companies are still grappling with the, with the balance between productivity in a space that is, re the competition is high and we need to deliver the bottom line and sometimes this has been done, sacrificing um, employee wellness, team wellness, in order to achieve results. Our focus has been primarily on achieving results for the shareholder and forgetting that stakeholders internally and externally really depend uh, on, on, on you know, getting that balance of how they work as much as it is about what they're working on. Many organizations globally, not just, uh, not just in Africa, have, have experienced this. And this is where you have bailout packages and stimulus packages in many countries. We've seen this in America. We've seen this happening in Europe. We've 
these are questions that have been raised in Africa as well, in many economies. Many companies have battled with weak financial reserves and the cash flow dependency on a particular paradigm of work has, uh, ha has limited our ability to continue to function at the same level of, um, of ca financial capability. Let's look at some external lessons that COVID has, has, has taught us. External to our organization, we've actually found that there actually has been no global economic level, uh, model that could have helped us preempt not only the pandemic, pandemic, but the impact, the significance of the impact of the pandemic. A pandemic which seemed to just be a health pandemic very quickly became not just an economic pandemic, but it also became a social pandemic. It challenged the way um, we interact with each other um, in social settings, with the social distancing, with the number of times we need to be sanitizing, with how, you know, with how we can communicate at a family level, with how we can communicate at a team level. There hasn't been an economic model um, that has prepared the world for the disruption that we have experienced. And so it's still a work in progress. At one point, we're told one meter apart is enough. And then we're told, no, actually, it isn't enough. We also need to keep our masks on. And then we've been told what kind of masks we need to, we, we need to be wearing in order to keep safe. The other thing is that actually what seemed like a far-fetched global risk actually had very significant domestic, domestic impacts. And there's been no legal recourse for this. Where, where do you take your concerns? Where, where, where do you get some sort of recompense you know, for, for, um, for, for the pandemic? Where do you get corporate redress? For the, for the corporate bottom line that has been impacted. Very, very difficult. Who do you hold to account for not being able to preemptively um, strategize? Is it the board? Is it the national, the, you know, the, the, the national government? Is it regional groupings? Very difficult. Global power plays. Now, this is where you see, you know, how each superpower, you know, has handled, uh, has handled the, the global pandemic. We've all, um, I'm sure, been privy to some of the exchanges been between the United States and, and China and many other significant, uh, significant economies. And these are things that we need to be watching and saying what looked like, uh, you know, an offshore risk actually has domestic impact. It's also become very, very clear that there are many economic sectors that have been very tenuous in the face of this uh, pandemic. Aviation, for example, um, about a month ago, at least 100,000 jobs in aviation and you know, limited to, to, to the pilots have been lost. And that is significant. Tourism, mining, fitness and personal care industries have been impacted very negatively. You cannot go into the gym now uh, and work out because of the risks, um, not just of the social distancing, but the fact that you know, your sweat um, in these shared spaces could pose a risk for the next individual. Competition, we've had to refine what is competition? Is competition something that we need to contain or is competition um, something that we need to actually work with. Is it containment or creep? And we're going to look at that a little later. Weak customer financial reserves. So external to our own corporates, we've realized that not only have we suffered the, you know, um, financial blows um, as corporates, it's that our customers are battling just as much. Our customers were in paid jobs and our customers were similarly running businesses and that is what gave our customers the disposable income to be able to spend on our, on our products and services. And if that has been impacted, and we have also been impacted internally in terms of our financial reserves and our cash flow adequacy, we have a dual pro problem to deal with. This just highlights the level of complexity that a pandemic like COVID 
has thrown into, you know, thrown into our, our already weakened situation, particularly as African economies. But even pandemics, even crises as we have experienced um, can, can throw opportunities, can open up opportunities. And it requires the transformational mindset to be able to say, can we make something out of this, uh, out of this crisis? What are some of those opportunities that we can glean from this situation? There are sectors that have been crisis resilient. And for example, agriculture. It doesn't matter how bad a pandemic gets, everybody still needs to eat. And um, therein lies an opportunity. There are sectors like technology. We've now, as organizations, had to take a step back and say, we still have clients out there, how do we engage with them? We still have staff, even though they may be working from home, how do we engage with them? How do we engage with stakeholders? How do we hold our board meetings? So technology is another area that we can look at and say, yeah, that presents an opportunity, an opportunity for how we work. It may change our business model, but asking the questions, how do we make that work so that we're still successful businesses? There are uh, sectors such as the health and sanitation sector. How do we engage there? Even for the sectors that seem to have, you know, dropped in terms of um, how they can engage with the customers, there's still opportunities. Personal, uh, personal care and fitness, for example. Is there a potential that you can convert your gym into an online, into an online offering? So old products, new uses, and new products. Innovative business models. Competition versus collaboration. This is not a zero sum game. There's a term known as coopetition. And for lack of a better word, um, somebody once coined, coined it as sleeping with the enemy. Basically trying to grow the market, the, the, the market by working together and being very clear as how each each collaborator within this equation um, works with the partners in order to grow the market. Strategic linkages. Maybe we shouldn't be both growing our crops, transporting them to the market, having our every, you know, all the variables in the supply chain under the one roof. Perhaps we need to be working with strategic partners in order to enhance our ability to survive as businesses and ensure that expertise is being placed where expertise is needed. And also, it's been very clear that even though this has been a global pandemic, each country has experienced it in a completely different way. In Zambia, where I'm sitting, a complete lockdown was virtually impossible because we have a hybrid economy in which some, you know, the, the informal sector, they get paid on a daily basis and they live off what they make on a daily basis. And so as business operators, as corporates, one of the things that we need to look at as much as there is, you know, a global pandemic, does one size fit all solutions work everywhere? And the answer is probably no. So let's have a look at how we work towards achieving a competitive edge. And what is a competitive edge? For the purpose of this presentation, I've defined it as leverage over or relative comp to competitors. And it's hinged on your customer and stakeholder value proposition. What, it, what is it you're offering compared to your, compared to your competitors? What is it your customers are looking for that they'll absolutely beat a path to your door for? Michael Porter, a business guru, defined competitive edge in this way. He said, it's about cost advantage and differentiation advantage. But I think that we've experienced that actually during this period, it's not just been about costs and it's not just about having a differentiated advantage. It's about having products and services which are being demanded and sought after even when it seems painful to acquire them. So we talked about the sectors that still present opportunities, agriculture. All of us have no choice but to have something to eat in order to sustain ourselves. And so those products really have 
you know, give those organizations a competitive edge. We will still have to get our medical supplies. We still have to engage with our families and find out how they're doing through technology. And so that in itself, or the, the models that utilize that sort of thinking will continue to have a competitive edge. This next slide just basically looks at the three, what Michael Porter, you know, posited as uh, what drives competitive edge costs and differentiation. And the one that I've added there is the strategic transformation. Costs in this case, is not just across the organization alone, your organization alone, it's across the partner chain. How do you interact with partners in order to keep your costs manageable as an organization? Do you have to have all your costs under the one roof? Is there room to outsource? Is there room to use shared services, you know, with other organizations or with other departments or with other collaborators within the supply chain? How do you work within the customer disposable income? If the customer's disposable income is muted, then you want to be investigating those, those delivery models that, that cost you less as an organization. Having all your staff under the one roof five days a week from eight to nine is probably costly. Is it possible to use less space and have your staff come in on alternate days? Whatever the solution is for the company, it's got to take into account that it needs to be adjusted and to match what your customers are willing and able to pay for. And they're happy to beat the, you know, the, 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 the door down in order to get your products and services. And it's about adjusting for pandemic risks. One thing that all companies have had to think about now is sanitizing. How do you ensure that the customers who come in are safe and the staff are safe? You sanitize right from the front door. How do you ensure that, uh, you know, once they're through the front door, your customers and your staff still remain safe? They come in with masks. Are there spaces in which you can continue to, to decontaminate? Every organization has to think about this. And that is going to affect the cost structure. It's something that now becomes a strategic consideration because customers want to come in and be sure that doing business with you is still their first choice because they're going to be safe. The differentiation, it's about structural and strategic agility. It's about saying, are we in collaboration? Are we in competition? And how do we structure our business? And how is our business from here on going to continue to be agile enough to adapt if it needs to be? Trust and service quality is going to be a big differentiator, a very, very big differentiator. When you can't engage with customers in the way that you did before, where you have the face-to-face -face interaction, there's got to be trust built through your technology platforms, through the regular communications, in which you tell them what you're doing, how you're doing it, and when things go wrong, how you're handling it preemptively. The one thing that businesses don't often do well is that they wait for the customer to complain, and then they reactively respond to that complaint. But going forward, trust is going to be a deal breaker. Trust and service quality. You may have fewer times in which to get the service right sending the wrong products, delivering the wrong quality of service um, is going to be a deal breaker, particularly as once you start to use virtual platforms, it, in, it, it, it just opens up a world of competition. You're no longer competing against yourself and within your own country, you're competing with the world. The strategic transformation really requires redefining the nature of what is your real business? Are you just selling shoes? or are you say, selling safety on, on, on feet? It's linkages to timeless sectors. As much as you may not be in the agricultural sector, is it possible, for example, for a financial services organization to partner with those sectors that are not as tenuous, that are timeless? So if I'm a financial services provider and all I did was you know, sell, to, sell finances to SMEs, make cash flow, uh, solutions available to, to SMEs or short-term financing, I might want to reconsider 
whether in fact it should be skewed more towards the agricultural sector, which is going to be a sector that is needed and is going to grow in innovation um, in order to ensure that my financial services business continues to thrive. And it's also about niche you know, versus shared value. Do I want 100% as a niche operator um, of a smaller market or do I want shared value of a strategic um, pipeline, a strategic collaboration with other businesses? Back to the financial services sector example. Again, if I am providing cash flow solutions to SMEs and what I do is provide short-term finance, because SMEs in the agricultural sector actually may need more than short-term finance, they may need seasonal loans, which take a little bit longer to, you know, to, 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 to mature before the product is out of them, it has hit the market and they've got their monies in. I might want to partner with a financial services provider who does exactly that. And we're feeding off each other's um, expertise. So what does global competitive strategic thinking look like? What is the kind of thinking that's going to keep a company um, holding its competitive edge? Global intelligence. We now are not in the era where all we need to understand is the national budget. We need as transformational leaders to be scanning the global landscape and monitoring what is happening? If, if we're hearing that there's going to be a second wave of the pandemic, guess what? We've had the first wave to learn some lessons, to see how we can improve how we do business. So global intelligence is going to become more and more critical. We need to be scanning ahead of time before the pandemic hits. We need to be future proofing, which is something that you know, we touched on in the previous slide. We need to be thinking about competition, cooperation versus competition or collaboration. We need to also be thinking it's beyond just technology. It's not, it's not just about ensuring that our businesses are technology enabled. Actually, what is it that we're doing with that technology beyond just communicating? The customer relationship management is something that's been with us for a very long time. Um, the past couple of decades have made this a go-to a go-to um, solution to understand the profile of our customers. How many customers do we have? What do their buying patterns look like? Um, uh, or at what price are they prepared to buy? Um, and we're able to see whether there's been loyalty or no loyalty. However, that sounds, all sounds very good, but in a lot of organizations, we've actually found that CRM, customer relationship management, has been used as a database manager, just knowing how many customers we have and what price they're buying at. This is something that every business now needs to look at. How are we using technology as a business driver, not just as a tool for information? Do we require, for example, to ensure that our customers actually have access to our technology, to apps through which they can engage with us? Certainly with our banks, financial services provider, we've seen more of this. Um, but it needs to be preemptive. A lot of this has happened on the back foot because we're playing catch up with uh, the challenges that we've had with the pandemic. How do we behave preemptively? We are now also finding that we need to understand our customers' strategies. If they have less disposable income, they're gonna put their money where it is most critical. What does that look like? We are customers to other businesses. And if we have a strategy, then our, the way we get our products and services certainly have to think about how our, our um, spending patterns are going to change. As, as companies in Africa, 
um, I can't stress this enough because price elasticity is something that, you know, we really, really have to understand is going to become more and more prevalent. And that if we're in the luxury sector, for example, if we're in tourism, then, you know, we need to have solutions packages that respond to the financially stressed customer. So let's understand the customer strategy and where it's going in order to, that we can make the internal adjustments for our own strategy. The other thing we need to think about is that when we talk about developing our teams, making the adjustments internally as to how our staff are reskilled in order to respond to the new strategy, the new way of working, the new business models, that enterprise team development is not just about our staff. It requires developing our partners as well. They need to understand what, you know, our partners need to understand the internal mechanisms, the internal workings of um, our strategy, the internal workings of our technology. We need to be constantly communicating with our partners and our stakeholders about what we're doing and how we can work together to grow the market, to grow the pie. And lastly, we want to be the employer of choice. Competitive, well-skilled, nimble staff is something that every organization is gonna be competing with. And now we're not just competing locally because if we can, if our staff can engage with us virtually, then guess what? They can engage with our competitors just as well virtually. They don't have to choose whether they're in one part of the country or the other. And it also means that geographic borders fall away. Companies outside of our own geographic market are able to engage with key skills, with key staff and competencies. And so we want to find employee management practices that make us the employer of choice, the flexibility, working in a manner that recognizes that staff members are stressed or staff members can, you know, work um, out, you know, from their homes. Staff members can work through the night and sleep through the day and they're not limited, limited by the, the clock. There's different ways of working. So every organization has to ask itself now, how do we make ourselves the employer of choice, the go-to? Embracing transformation. This is something that we need to be wary of. Wherever transformation is occurring, it's about doing things differently in a way that ensures that we have um, stellar success, that we're achieving you know, phenomenal success in our organizations. This is what we have to be wary of. Any future that we can imagine as leaders or as corporates is really crafted from previous experiences. There's a way in which we think, there's a way in which we imagine that's really boundaried by what we know, our worldview, where we're coming from. For somebody like myself, who's come from the corporate sector, worked in uh, Africa, it may be very difficult for me to imagine uh, a scenario of the future um, that is similar to somebody who's, say, in the Far East, simply because of our worldviews. And therefore, in order to have a future focus, a futuristic view of a scenario, it's going to require that we introduce diversity into the way in which we think. As we sit around strategy or executive or boardroom tables, we need, we need to be looking at where are we gonna get the brightest uh, and most provocative ideas in order for us to imagine how we would respond to a future scenario, a future pandemic, what strategy should look like for the, in the next 10 years, broken down into bite-sized chunks. Because in an unstable world with such volatility, we have to break down our long range views into smaller strategies that we can manage within perceivable timeframes. 
the timelines that we're working with, don't know if it's two years now, or for now, it may be as short as every three months. We should be reviewing our, uh, our strategy and looking at, where, at whether our scenarios, our business scenarios of the future are still relevant. And so the diversity around the boardroom tables, the executive tables, and the wild cards we throw there has to come from a diversity of thinking and not more of the same of ourselves. Now, transformation first starts with the leader. We're talking about transformational leadership here. And Lewis Mumford said this, growth and, and self-transformation cannot be delegated. It has to be very deliberate. And that means that everybody who is in a position of, uh, of leadership um, at a corporate level has to start thinking about strategic visioning as the new normal. In it, literally reflective practice, has to be part of every executive's um, uh, calendar. Reflective practice is a practice which in management coaching is not simply about saying what happened. Using a model called Bolton's model of reflection is about saying what happened, okay? And then asking the question, what does it mean? What does it mean that this happened? What does it mean for us as a business? What does it mean for me as a leader? And once we've synthesized that, it's then about saying, so what are we going to do about it? That model of reflection, you know, helps us to, 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 to have a visionary view of what's, what the next steps are going to be that we're going to take. It's also about developing a capability for uncertainty. Uncertainty doesn't go away. So this is not about saying that we're doing away with uncertainty. This is about saying we know uncertainty will happen, but how am I preparing myself to understand how to handle that uncertainty? And that may simply be, you know, may, may be doing things as simple as understanding how to manage diversity of talent, how to, how to handle remote working. How do you keep people motivated when you're working in a blended environment? How do you keep the results coming in? How do you keep the bottom line, how do you ensure that it's not just your financial bottom line that's working well? How do you continue to contribute to social and environmental um, bottom lines, well-being? So it's about introspection and prospection. Introspection is where you're looking back at what happened. Prospection is about looking forward about what could happen and what should happen within the organization to respond to what could happen. It's about enterprise leadership. Now, this is where we need to challenge ourselves as leaders and say, I might have qualified to be an engineer, but actually the organization needs an all-rounder. Uh, the organization needs a chief executive or an executive at every level to understand the whole enterprise. It's about enterprise management now, understanding every facet of the organization, whether it's about business process re-engineering and how you know, processes need to be re-engineered in order to deliver results. How do we engineer these processes so we can pick up where performance is not going as it should? How do we, how do we monitor the red flags? How do we preempt the red flags in our business model? So an engineer is suddenly going to have to understand financial management just as well. And uh, somebody who's in corporate development is going to have to understand technology just as well and uh, talent management practices, you know, just as well. Being an all-rounder is going to be, you know, a highly sought after capability and suddenly it's going to change how CVs look for top talent, for those who lead organizations that are continually transforming. Uh, a business study sh actually showed that some of the, um, you know, some, some really great uh, transformational leaders have worked in roles that did not necessarily keep them skewed, stuck in their particular qualification. And that comes from them being able to challenge themselves and surround themselves with diversity thinkers. Managing complex systems is going to become critical because those systems are not just internal, the systems are actually occurring outside of your own work environment. Those systems may be regulatory, those systems may be simply market systems, they could be 
all manner of uh, systems outside of the organization. There's also getting the balance between adopting global solutions and domesticating your own solutions. Um, one of the observations I have made is that, um, that there's been a very different way in which, you know, perhaps the COVID pandemic has affected some economies compared to others. There's a very big temptation to take an American solution and adapt it locally when in fact, you know, the manner in which the pandemic has affected Zambia or affected Africa has been very, very different. And for example, shutting down a, an economy totally in America, which has the financial man, you know, muscle to be able to provide stimulus packages and support you know, to their businesses, um, may, may look very, very different in an economy, you know, like the one in which we're in at the moment in Africa, where the government may be, not be able to step in and may be depending on collaborating, uh, collaborating partners. So to take a 20 pound hammer in order to kill a fly may not be the best solution for a corporate um, in the local environment. But a leader, anybody leading these organizations has to understand how they're going to get that balance right. If you, an executive who works for a global organization may have a strategy cascaded from the global HQ outside of Africa, which is fine. However, a transformational executive sitting within that global organization needs to customize the response in a manner that keeps the business afloat locally. And when they, it contributes to the um, consolidated financials at the, end of, at the end of the financial year, it still makes sense for that business to continue to survive in the local economy. So deliberate leadership. Um, we talked about the deliberateness of transformation. It's not going to happen by default and it's not going to happen by hoping. A transformational leader has to take the bull by the horns and say, I'm going to do this. We're going to look at two theories that help us understand this. The theory of self-determination. What does this theory teach us? It says that individuals actually gravitate and are motivated by personal growth and ability. Um, and it is premised on a leader has some autonomy to make decisions. Nobody is without choice. And actually, we're in positions of leadership because we have that capacity, not only to um, take up responsibility, but also we, it comes with authority. So that in itself provides a level of autonomy to contribute to how we move forward. A leader has the competencies and they have the relationships and the networks in order to be able to determine how they move forward. Now, at this stage, we're talking about the leader themselves and the stresses that you know, organizations and corporate leaders are going through at the moment, they have the power to determine how they move forward regardless. The other theory is that of ex existentialism. And this is what existentialism says. It says, it, despite what has happened, regardless of the extenuating circumstances, people still have the power to choose how they're gonna move forward from that, from those circumstances. They have the power of will to make the choices that determine their response and outcomes um, in life. So a leader does have the power to bounce back. And I want to quote from a gentleman called Viktor Frankl. Now, Viktor Frankl wrote, um, wrote a, a, a book on, um, on how people move forward from difficult situations. Viktor Frankl was a survivor of the Holocaust. And despite having been imprisoned in a concentration camp for three years, as a researcher, as a neuro, uh, as a neuroscientist, he still, he survived three years in a concentration camp and actually found that it is possible in minus 60 degree temperatures to survive on one slice of bread and a bowl of cabbage soup once a day. 
And when he examined why he was surviving, it was because he had made the choice that when he came out of the concentration camp, he was going to be speaking on his new science research in front of crowds of people that sustained him. And he basically says that everything can be taken away from us other than this, the loss of the freedoms to choose how one, the, one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. So as transformational leaders, leaders still have the power to choose how to bounce back from a difficult situation. But a leader is not a leader unless they're leading teams. And if you're a transformational leader, then the thing they're going to be doing is driving transformational teams. Francis Hesselbein says, these, says this, leadership is not necessarily just about how to do, but how to be. So transformation is not something that you do in bursts and spouts. Transformation is a mindset. It is a way of being. It is a culture that you adopt. And it's a culture that you then ingrain in the teams that you work with. And transformation cannot happen where only one person has, you know, is transforming themselves. Working in an organization is about creating the motivation and the aspiration from the top and cascading it through every level of the organization and ensuring that teams are not just empowered, but also skilled to, to provide that leadership continuity. And that similar aspiration and, uh, and power and authority to continue that transformation. So the foresight culture will start at the board level and it will cascade through the, through the organization. But one also has to manage this transition. And that transition comes from doing a corporate audit. Where are we now and where do we need to be? Transformation is not just about saying how do we increase from where we are by 20% in terms of our financial bottom line or in terms of the time in which we deliver our service or the types of products, the range of products and services that we deliver. It's about looking at a, 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 at a future goal and saying what is the gap that we need to close. So there's, a, there's, a, there's an air of being audacious there. A transformational teams are strengths-based growth teams. Now, roles are often written and cast in stone and you know, people are fitted to roles, which is fine. But as we look at the changed paradigm, the environment in which we're operating, the question to ourselves should be, where are our team's strengths and how do we use those strengths to the benefit of the organization? Adopting a strengths-based um, approach to business success and business continuity um, has, been, has been researched and found to be powerful in this way. The best way I can say it in simple terms is when you're operating your strengths, it feels like walking downhill. When you're operating from a place of weakness, it feels like walking uphill. And adopting a strengths-based approach ensures that the organization is using the best of its skills at least cost. There's also a caveat I need to throw in there, and that sometimes strengths can actually blindside us. When we know we're strong, let's say in, um, as an example, if an individual is very strong at managing numbers, they get blindsided to what those numbers should mean in the, con the larger context of the business. Sometimes we have to lose some money in order to generate more. And so what may be a strength in one context can be a serious hindrance in another. And if we're creating enterprise leaders, that holistic approach using strengths, you know, team strength is critical, getting that balance right. I already alluded to the fact that research, intelligence, and analysis is going to be very critical in any team that wants to be able to, to, you know, to plan scenarios of the future that they want to see. And this is where you know, the human resources department, the human capital department, the people and you know, the people management uh, you know, departments need to recraft 
what do great skills actually look like and what do they deliver? How do they deliver um, you know, their skills and their competencies in a blended work environment using technology? But let's bring it home. Um, some of this, as much as you know, it's something that we've experienced, can seem a little um, theoretical uh, because we're uh, we're looking at a lot of what's happened with the pandemic through the through the lenses of what we hear through global media or through what's been handed in terms of what the World Health Organization is saying or what international and bilateral donors may be saying. You cannot transform an organization in Zambia or in Africa, wherever we may be, in Malawi, in, in Rwanda, in, in South Africa, with actually, without actually understanding the very unique business environment and the cultural context in which we're operating. What does that business environment look like? For example, um, you may have a model that says um, corruption is bad for business, but actually you may be in an environment where the reason certain businesses thrive is unfortunately because it exists. And once it's taken away, uh, the business may not survive. This is not about promoting corrupt environments or non-ethical behaviors or non-legal behaviors. But it's really about saying the transformation leader needs to con you know, correctly analyze, quantify, and then strategize how to manage their business within the business and cultural context in which they operate. If the cultural context says that we do not sell certain products before 10 hours, then you've got to comply with that environment. And no matter how much um, you know, that may work within a different environment, it won't work locally. It's very, very important to understand your local context. Talking about technology as another example, it's all very well to say um, because of social distancing, we will now move to a completely technology-based virtual environment in which we do business. The truth is that that will not work, that will not fly in the rural areas of, uh, of, of Africa. And I dare say that may not work in the rural areas of Europe or the United States. And so that cultural context needs to be taken into account. Politics, governance, law and ethics have already alluded to that. We do not become ethical simply because there's an ethical code. We become ethical because we deliberately apply it in our organizational um, uh, ethos. What happens now that business is constrained? Do the barometers change? These are very real questions that every leader who's looking at transforming how they do business and why they do business, these are very real questions to be asked. What do you relax? What don't you relax? And remember that we did allude to the fact that business is gonna be driven on the basis of customer service as well as trust, the quality of service and trust. And in the same manner as which business has changed in, you know, we can do business virtually, information knows no borders, no boundaries. And so we are listening to alternatives out there we have a hybrid business economy. We're talking about corporate leaders in the context of this uh, presentation. Corporate leaders are doing business with businesses, but they're also doing businesses with a very informal sector, with the people who, um, th there's no social distancing in, 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 uh, in Africa's compounds, for example. And so how are you going to continue to deliver the services and the products if you can't put them on the shelves in the supermarket? Do you recruit members of that community? Is this perhaps an, a social investment or is this a new business model that you need to think about? Do you recruit the people in the compounds to become little satellite businesses through which you extend your products and services? Something to think about. But the important thing is to recognize that even in the single economy and even in just one general geographic location um, in an economy, 
there is a hybrid business economy. Isolate the particular country volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, uh, you know, issues that you need to deal with. What may they be? It's very easy for a business to take its eyes off uh, the ball and forget that there's just been elections in Malawi within this COVID period, and that there's going to be elections, for example, in Zambia in the next year, and are we strategizing ahead and thinking ahead as to how we drive aspirational um, goals, audacious goals, in such an environment. So that's another level of uncertainty that we have to deal with. Keep in mind the global competitive power play and the agenda. There's, um, there's a tussle for territory and prominence. There's a tussle for global leadership. What does that mean at a local level? If you're a chief executive that works in an NGO sector, as for example, and suddenly one of the big power players is pulling its money out of that particular uh, grant, what does it mean for your organization? Transformation needs, also needs for any leader to recognize that there's got to be very meaningful next generational leadership development. It is a relay. Um, and the next generational leaders on this continent are the young ones, 35 and below. And that to ignore um, their, their role, uh, their, 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 the power of who they are in this techno-enabled generation and this, in this generation of creativity uh, and business unusual, could actually sound the death knell. The other thing about um, you know, developing the next generation leaders is we've got to recognize that these bright young people are beyond just bread and butter issues. They, they want to be acknowledged for their skills and it doesn't have to be the engineering skills. It could be, I'm a creative, I sing, or I do comic strips or I, um, I find a way in which to manage cows that's never been done before. So as much as remuneration is an important part of what business does, a business needs to understand that uh, the next generation leaders are looking for significance. And I think that this is something that we're seeing playing out, uh, playing out in Africa, voices that need to, be, need to be heard in the workplace. Stifling those voices in the workplace is to lose the power of diversity and um, thinking about how we do business in the future. In the scenario planning that we do, this is a very, uh, a very significant variable for corporate sustainability and needs to be thought about now. And it's about social investment as well. Uh, when we talk about social investment, uh, we're all coming you know, to this conversation from, a very, from very depressed economies, regardless of where we are. Now, in order to stimulate, re-stimulate business um, in, 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 our, uh, in our customer base, there may need to be some social investment that we put in there. And that may mean if, for example, we're an insurance business, our question should be, how do we work with the health providers to ensure that life assurance, um, you know, life assurance products and services, which are predominantly grudge purchases, um, continue, continue to perform well. Um, we have an example of one broker locally who partnered with uh, a health provider to, to provide um, the monitoring of uh, vitals such as blood pressure and diabetes so that customers are able to, 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 to manage their health better. And if they can manage their health better, then their premiums should be more favorable. But that's one way of building business continuity and building models that actually take what should have been a paid for service such as the monitoring of vitals and made it part of the business model in order to enhance um, possibilities for our own businesses. 
So ultimately, if we had to summarize the role of a transformational leader, a transformational leader is one who is juggling and building a capability for uncertainty and volatility while painting pictures of possibilities. Any transformational leader has to energize team members and partners. Remember we mentioned team members now should include partners, strategic stakeholders, and may even involve competition. We've got to be able to energize our internal teams, restructure our strategy and how our business models behind the possibility of a future that delivers sterling results for the organization. This continues to be a converse, an ongoing conversation. And so the lessons, we're still going to be learning lessons. The lessons are evolving today as we speak. Um, the lessons are being learned not just from political leaders, global leaders. The lessons are being learned at the lowest levels as well. Um, we have situations, for example, where the lady who sells bananas won't stand at the street corner but will go from door to door. That's a change in business models. And corporate needs to recognize where the strategic shifts are happening. Some of them are seismic shifts. They may require a complete rethinking of how we do business. And others may be a growing phenomenally from where we are. But whichever way, it's about a duality of strategy, protecting what we have while taking new risks to, in order to become competitive in this corporate world in which uh, there are no borders. Technology knows no borders. Um, I've come to the end of my presentation and um, we, will take, um, we will take questions now. Um, and uh, yes, we have a couple of questions already. Uh, a question from Collins Nurenda. He says, knowing most of the businesses in Zambia are informal, how can those in the informal businesses deal with rigid structures for them to cope up with their businesses? Knowing that most of them have low levels of business skills and technology. This is absolutely true, um, uh, Collins. I will answer this in two ways. When we talk about uh, technology, um, remember we're talking predominantly from corporate, corporate uh, Africa, you know, from the, from the perspective of corporate Africa. So corporate Africa engaging with the informal businesses, they have to find ways of engaging with the informal businesses in order to continue to have the customer base. And you're absolutely right. Not everybody in our, uh, in our informal you know, sectors in Africa is going to have the technology. This is where we have to ask ourselves, is there a, 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 a dual strategy we need to have? For those who are not in the informal space, we can use technology. For those who are in the informal space, do we need to have safe and satellite ways in which to position ourselves in the places where our informal businesses are found. The second way I'll answer this is, if you are an informal business currently, it, my, my experience has been, in fact, the mo informal businesses are the most nimble. They, they have a way of adjusting more phenomenally than big corporates because big corporates are this big elephant that it takes a lot to change your, 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 your structure and your products. Those who are informal businesses need also to recognize that technology is not necessarily about a laptop or a, or a tablet, and that some of this business can be handled on the phone. And there's many apps, and really those you know, technology providers are finding ways of ensuring that there's apps, you know, there's so many apps in which you can do business off the back of your phone. However, one of the ways that I think informal businesses need to adapt is to really understand what customer, you know, what customer service and trust is. Unfortunately, delivering on time, delivering the right thing, 
and re returning calls, basic things like that are almost seem mythical with our informal businesses. Technology is not the answer to everything. But the way of doing business, whatever model the informal business chooses, they have to build that trust and quality of service. That, I, I believe that for the informal business sector, that is going to be the deal breaker. If I can trust that you're going to bring me my fish, my dry fish on a Friday, I then know that I will not have to try and go to a shop. But if it's a hit and miss, and I can't count on you to, to, to deliver on Friday, and you come and deliver on Saturday, you will find that I've made a plan B. And I think that, you know, those who work with informal businesses, this is an area of training and that becomes, that is their enterprise. That is the phenomenal transformational shift the informal business sector has to make. That you can't take chances on letting customers down. They're working on trust and they're working on quality of service whether or not you have the technology. That's, that's not even a business skill, it's common sense. So I hope I've answered that, Collins. Um, then Collins also had another question. He says, kindly shed more light on leadership, how to be and not how to do. The best way I can explain this, uh, Colin, is to say this. Uh, I like to say that in any organization, um, or in a community, for example, you become a leader before you become a leader. What does that actually mean? Why do, um, you know, why do people, why do some people get promoted and not others? The ones who get promoted demonstrated the character, the behaviors of a leader. So we we're talking about this a little bit earlier and I'll repeat it. If you have not been able to demonstrate that you can work on own initiative when the boss is not looking and you can't deliver to your deadlines on time, why would somebody then promote you to chief executive? However, on the other hand, if you've been able to demonstrate that you work on own initiative, regardless of whether you've been, you, you've been told to do something or not to do something, then innately you have created that psychological goodwill in, in, you know, in, in the bosses or in the HR department where they are confident that you're able to work on own initiative and that is a key skill for somebody who is in a position of leadership. So leadership, it, it's who you are and it shows out in what you do. So you might think that this is a bit of a chicken and egg situation. It's what you've done before, and that has demonstrated that you, you have the leadership qualities. And because you have the leadership qualities, you're promoted to leadership, and you continue to demonstrate it through what you do. When I said it's not what you do, so if I deliver a report on time, because I was asked to deliver on a report on time, that does not necessarily um, show leadership it shows that I am compliant. But if I deliver a report on time, regardless of whether I've been asked to or not, I have demonstrated leadership. It's who I am and it shows in what I do. I hope that makes sense. We're going on to the next question. The next question is from Chileshe Mwila. And the question is, how would you describe is the best way to inculcate transformational leadership at all levels of an organization. So, um, Shlesha, the way I would explain this is that um, there's two ways. One, it's role modeling, and two, it is the deliberateness. So, we have had great leaders in Africa who've been great role models um, and uh, that's brilliant and we celebrate them. However, without a deliberate agenda to create a culture of transformation, which then be becomes part of who we are, we continue to have a great leader and then a not so great leader. 
because we haven't deliberately planned for the leadership continuity and we haven't engendered a culture of transformation. Earlier in the presentation, you recall that I said that, you know, one of the things that we need to adopt is a culture of foresight, continually having the foresight. The danger when you have a pandemic as we have is we will fix the urgent and forget the important. And urgent is important, but we generally then take, you know, you know, take our eye off what we need to be working towards over the next 10 years. Transformational leadership is not about transforming one thing today. It's about continually transforming and creating a culture of transformation within the organization at every level. So when you role model, you demonstrate how it's done. You demonstrate how I, you know, I demonstrate how I be a leader, how I be in leadership. As I work with the team, you know, to, 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 to continually, if I involve my team in how are we planning for the future, how are we using the intelligence that we have, how are we analyzing the impact of the pandemic, how are we analyzing the impact of the elections, how are we analyzing the impact of wellness in our organization, and how do we use it going forward, uh, um, then we help our teams understand what transformation actually looks like in practice. Remember that we're also talking about a strength-based approach to transformation. And a strength-based approach uses everybody's strengths and we use that diversity to drive an organization into its success. I hope, I hope I've answered um, I hope I've answered that one um, well, uh, Chilesha. Um, we'll move on to the next question. Um, the next question is, kindly shed more light on the VUCA world principle. And again, that's from Chilesha Mwila. So the VUCA world principle basically recognizes that the world is never static that, you know, it's like a river. And somebody once said, uh, when you step into a river, you know, it, it, when you step into, the sa into a river, it's not the same river and it's not the same water because it's continually moving. And that is what the VUCA world is. The more variables that play into what can affect our business, the more turbulent the environment is. Okay, so... I'll explain that. If all I do is supply bananas to um, a shop that I'll call uh, Shop Next, that's all I ever do, supply bananas to Shop X, to Shop Next. When Shop Next relocates, it increases my variables of, um, th th that contribute to, to, to uncertainty. Now I have to introduce the factor of a bus ride to go to shop next. If shop next um, loses its license to operate, suddenly I, I, I am reminded that now I have to uh, include the variable of a conversation with a completely new player in my, in my quest to sell my bananas. Then it changes my price. It changes who I do, you know, who I may be speaking to. And they may simply say, sorry, you don't, you don't sell the quantities that we require on a daily basis. Instead of 20 kilos, it needs to be 200 kilos. And suddenly, I now have to start thinking, I still want to sell my 20 kilos. I better now have a, a partnership with somebody else who sells bananas. And I may find somebody who sells banana, you know, 80 kilos of bananas. What that does is it then takes the leverage out of my hands. So the more variables you have to deal with as an organization, the more volatile your environment. The environment that we're talking about, the, you know, the global pandemic, I've already alluded to the fact that here was a global pandemic starting in Wuhan, China. I, I still don't have a clue where on the map Wuhan sits because I haven't investigated it. I know it's in China, 
but I'm wearing a mask and socially distancing in Zambia because that that volatility across, across the globe has had an impact on every other country. It's had an impact with countries that, uh, you know, African countries do business with. So Malawi with Zambia, Zambia with uh, West Africa, West Africa with uh, China, China with Australia. So the uncertainty, the volatility, the volatility, the uncertainty, the complexity of the variables that we're dealing with and the ambiguity, ambiguity because we cannot possibly know everything that's oper operating outside of our environment that may affect us. For example, we may in Africa not have the same number of um, COVID cases as we're hearing about in Italy or in America. However, if the American economy imploded, that would have serious implications upon economies in Africa that get support for their health, um, for, for their health sector from America. If the pandemic in China flares up again, then suddenly some of their products, which we get cheaply, will not come through at the same price or at the same rate. This is where the principle of a, a VUCA world come from. I'll take a question from Tom. What exactly makes transformational leadership the best leadership style? The reason, Tom, I, I think transformational leadership is the best leadership style is because it recognizes that the same way the world is not static, it continues in, uh, in its complexity, in its volatility and uncertainty. Transformational leaders understand that. And they're constantly finding a way in which to navigate through those periods of volatility, of uncertainty, of ambiguity. So basically a transformational leader is saying this, that as much as I am trying to protect what we've already achieved, I recognize that the best strategy for achieving a competitive edge is to be thinking ahead, painting a picture of what the future could look like and crafting a strategic response to address that, that future, to skill my staff for that future, resource my business for that future, create relationships where we can sh have shared value in that future. So transformational leadership should always be a step of ahead, a, a step ahead wherever possible. Um, a question from Mark Chindumba says, given the degree of volatility, do you think the private sector are equipped enough to thrive amidst the corona pandemic? Can they embrace transformational leadership? Absolutely. Um, the one thing about the private sector is that it can be agile. Unlike, uh, you know, public sector institutions that really um, work on the process of getting consensus from a multiplicity of decision makers, the private sector generally tends to be more responsive uh, to strategic changes. So the example I might give is if you wanted to change something phenomenally in the legal system at a national level, all of this has to go through parliament and we all know that the wheels of government do not grind too fast. And so to put in legislation or to change legislation is a very, very slow grind. Whereas with the private sector, because they're in the business of business for business, they're always monitoring the financial bottom line and whether it's a business you know, that has shareholders or whether it's a, a proprietor owned business, they will generally tend to be more agile in saying, this is how we work towards business survival and business growth. So in terms of, are they equipped? They're generally more, more agile. Being equipped depends on the quality of leadership the quality of leadership and their ability to be decisive enough to make those audacious changes that they need to make 
and to accept that there may need to be some strategic reform, some structural reform in terms of the products, in terms of the pricing, in terms of the business model, in terms of the partners. I mentioned earlier that going through the economic upheaval that we've experienced can make everybody, including leaders, very, very nervous and ensure, you know, unsure of what decisions to make next. But this is the thing that regardless of what has happened, it's happened to every business at some level or the other. Some leaders will bounce back very, very quickly and say, this is how we change and others leaders will not. Those that will bounce back more quickly are probably those who have a transformational mindset who've come to the acceptance that we're not, you know, the old way of doing business has changed. We're now in business and unusual and they're asking themselves the question, I've reflected on what happened, I've analyzed what it means, and I've looked at what we're going to do now. The what now question is, you know, what a transformation, a tra transformative leader should be saying. Okay, so um, from Thomas Miova, uh, no, sorry, I've already answered that one. Uh, Mark Chinduma says, shed some more light on competitive edge. So competitive edge, leverage, your advantage. What makes, what makes a customer want to continue to do business with you as opposed to your, your, your competitor? It may be something very, very simple. It may be as simple as you deliver when you say you'll deliver. Your competitor may have just as good a product, um, but they're erratic. They don't keep to their word. They may, they may even be able to sell their product at a lower price than yourself. But your competitive edge may be your ability to just deliver on time. Now, we're talking about that at an individual level. At a corporate level, at a corporate level, your competitive edge is this, that you're able to reach your customers, deliver to your customers what you said that you would, and you're able to follow through and you're continually scanning how you can serve them better. Yesterday's good, maybe today's not so great. And today's not so great will tomorrow be the company that used to be a company in demise. So competitive edge, basically, if I were to put it in very simple terms, why do people want to do business with you as opposed to your competitor? And that's not just talking about your relatives. Your family members may feel that they have no choice but to do business with you. We're not talking about those who don't have a choice. We're talking about when they do have a choice, what is it that brings them back to you? Again, um, to give an example, in our market, we have road license, right? And every vehicle that uh, drives on the roads of Zambia has to have a road license, all right? So I will get my road license and I will get my insurance, but that's because it's a legal requirement. If it wasn't a legal requirement, would I still pay for road license? I don't know, maybe, maybe not. And those are the sort of questions any business should act, ask itself. If, if I was the, you know, I was not the only business, would my customers continue to do business with me? And what is that edge that they come to me for? So Thomas Miola says, where would I find resources for becoming or refining my transformational leadership skills? There's uh, a, a lot of resources, you know, that are available for, for, for transformational leadership skills in the sense that there's um, lots of information out there, um, lots of programs, you know, we're talking about UNICAF here. But a transformational leader is not just about the qualification and about the cognitive skills. 
transformational leadership requires behavioral changes in skills as well. How do you get those? It may be by getting a mentor, getting a coach, but also, you know, in a workspace where perhaps you're not being coached, feedback from your team members is invaluable. And if you're a leader and you do not think that your team members are going to give you honest information, let them, let them provide feedback anonymously. Many organizations um, do uh, feedback surveys, employee feedback surveys and, and, and other surveys. But Thomas, um, all I can say to you, if you go online, you will find that there's a phenomenal amount of, you know, information um, and, you know, resources on transformational leadership skills. However, once you've got that knowledge, the true proof in the pudding is in the behavioral changes. Example, a transformational leader will not be transformational if he doesn't delegate to his team members so that they can also use their strengths. Delegation is one of those skills. Communication, be able to communicate to team members with absolute clarity so that you're all on the same page and you know what the deliverables are, the time frame, and who is accountable for those deliveries, deliverables is an imperative. You do find leaders who hold information close to the chest because they feel that monopoly of information is power. That's actually detrimental to organizational transformation and developing transformational people around you. So when you have got the cognitive skills and the knowledge, you then need to also um, develop the behaviors and those come with practice. Um, for the first question, yes, Thomas, I saw the, the yes, I saw the correction. Um, there's a question here from Obi Mundia, who says the stimulus package is de declared by government, for example, in Zambia, covers mostly SME sectors, while the effect of COVID-19 has affected large enterprises in two folds, reduced consumption of the manufactured products, and reduced window for exports due to COVID restrictions while tax, tax obligations remain unchanged. What immediate strategies do these companies undertake in the short term to mitigate this challenge? So, um, Obi, um, I absolutely hear you. Now, there's a plethora of strategies that, uh, you know, larger organizations can take, and some of them have already taken some of these organizations, some of these um, uh, implemented some of these strategies. For example, they've, they've, they've had a look at what their staff, you know, team complement looks like and what their cost structures look like. And they've asked themselves, how do we continue to, to survive whilst retaining the best talent? Uh, a, a good organization will have conversations with um, its team and, and, you know, acknowledge that there is a problem. I don't think there's a single business in this world that can have a conversation with the team members who would not understand that, uh, you know, they're going through challenges. However, examples would be, rather than letting staff go, is there a way um, staff time, staff contribution to the organization can be paid for on, let's say, a three day a week basis. What that does is this, it enables the staff member to readjust and maybe see how they can sell their services else how or take on other small businesses uh, while keeping, you know, while keeping their obligations to their organization going so that the organization continue, can continue to survive. Others may say, how do we stagger payments to staff or how do we enable clients to acquire our products and service in phased approach? Or can we get bank holidays for overdrafts that we have? So each organization is going to have to examine, analyze what is our biggest challenge at the moment? Where are our biggest cost centers? Is it in the, you know, is it in the, the level of stock that we have? Are we able to reduce that stock? Is it in that we keep the factory running for 24 hours? Are we able to run it for 18 hours and keep uh, a, a skeleton staff? 
So Obi, there's no one answer for every corporate. Each one has to do a, a thorough analysis um, of its own organization to find, um, to find the answer for you know, their strategic response to this. Judith Mutello says, transformation in practice is looking, for the, looking forwards to the future. Kindly shed more light on this assumption because we have no ability to determine the future. I will take COVID-19 as one aspect that has hit the many transformations for 2020. Yes, absolutely, at a, at a, you know, even at a personal level. So Judith, it's true. No, nobody can you know, predict the future with 100% uh, accuracy. The idea between transformation in practice is that you're working with scenarios. You're looking at, you know, in the next two years, you know, having gone through COVID, and hearing that there may be you know, more waves of COVID, COVID is here to stay, the organization needs to be saying, in this scenario, what are the possibilities you know, that could hit us? One, it could be that COVID comes with a vengeance and that um, you know, maybe 200,000 you know, more cases are declared in a country where there were previously only 10 cases in a period of six months. Okay, so if you plot that scenario, what would your response be as an organization? The second response may be, yes, COVID is here to stay, and so health is going to continue to be an issue. Do we move from being a fully face-to-face -face organization and become a fully virtual organization? What are the implications? That's another scenario. So as many scenarios as you can, you can possibly brainstorm is the scenarios that you work backwards from and say as an organization, what would our response be to scenario one or scenario two or scenario three? Now, having too many scenarios also can be limiting, uh, or in, rather, sorry, let me say that again, having too many scenarios can be overwhelming. So what an organization needs to do is reduce the number of scenarios to the most plausible and there may be only three plausible futures. And you would you know, plot a structure, a strategic response to each one of those three scenarios. It's very possible that when the future actually happens, it's a hybrid of two of those plausible futures. And that then you, you have meanwhile worked out a strategy that can possibly be used as a hybrid response to that future. So growth and self-transformation cannot be delegated. Can I, sh can I shed more light? Yes, if I'm a, transformation, I'm a transformative leader, I have to work. I have to work on my growth and my self-transformation. And I know that what that means. For example, today, my biggest challenge may be in keeping governance and accountability working because all my staff members are now working from home. How do I know how to keep them inspired, motivated? How can I ensure that even though they're working from a home environment, we can still deliver our strategy on time and we can review? So I, as the leader, then needs to say to myself, I need to understand the best way to manage and motivate remote teams. My answers may be in more training. My answers may be in coaching. My answers may simply be in providing resources, technological resources to my team. My answer may be in ensuring that all my team have access to a wellness, uh, a wellness coach or a therapist so that when they're feeling stressed, um, they can call on this wellness coach or therapist to support them. So growth and self-transformation requires me as a, trans as a transformative leader to investigate what's the difference between what we need to achieve and my skills to be able to help my team achieve. And everybody, everybody should be on a growth path. Um, Adult learning, there's a lot of adult learning theories out there. And basically adult learning uh, works where the individual is self-motivated to drive their personal growth. So it's not like 
um, at school where I have to be told when to submit my assignment. I know what my strengths, strengths are and what my weaknesses are in a particular area and what the growth gap looks like. Chileshe Mwila, so sorry. Um, Manny says, no, sorry, that was Manny's question. So let me move to Chileshe Mwila again. What would be the best strategy for implementing transformational leadership in the public sector? I think this is one which sits with the, the, the HR unit of the public sector. And so in a country like Zambia, it would be cabinet office to rethink how do we, you know, how do we entrench transformational leadership? So that's where the HR and the talent management strategy would be sitting. That's where they would have to do this thinking. Fred Mukanzo says, how are our leaders helping small scale businesses during this COVID-19 since other business sectors are shut down? I suspect that this is one for um, our political and government leaders to, to answer because uh, I'm not privy to what they have in place for small scale businesses. I did see in an earlier, sub, uh, in an earlier question that uh, a lot of the funds available are being um, channeled towards SMEs rather than big corporates. And basically I'd imagine that it's the small corporates because they would be most profoundly affected by, um, by COVID without having any financial reserves. Um, Andrew Chivale says in building a competitive edge on the cost advantage principle, won't adjusting prices for a product or service to meet customers' disposable income directed towards a given manufacturing organization affect quality of service delivery or product quality? How does an organization ensure that it builds an excellent competitive edge without ending up in a loss? Kindly shed more light. So Andrew, um, uh, maybe I can answer that first by asking another question. There's organizations that will not drop their prices and they will remain with stock. Um, holding redundant uh, stock is just as costly. Remember that there's fixed costs that an organization deals with. It may be warehousing costs, it may be lighting costs, it may be you know, land rates. Those costs still have to be paid. And so what happens is when you reduce a, uh, you know, the price on a product, what you're reducing is the contribution, the margin of contribution towards those costs. However, if let's say you're in the business of, uh, you, you're in the business of, um, we, we talked earlier with uh, the, the, you know, the team, uh, the panelists um, about office space. If office space isn't occupied uh, by tenants, the rates, the, the, the land rates will not change. However, if you have 100% capacity and your office space is uh, occupied just to the tune of 40%, or it's, uh, you know, it, it's a contribution towards your land rates. So the margin within which you need to subsidize reduces. Supposing you have 100% occupancy and, you know, 40% of your businesses are struggling and they've asked for a review of rental costs and you say no. So now what you have is 6% of your office space is occupied because 40% of your tenants can no longer afford and they, and they leave your office premises. They give you notice and they terminate their lease agreements. What happens is that now you are going to have to bridge the, 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 you know, the 40%. You much rather have an adjustment on price than not have a contribution to your cost overheads. Uh, Quimba Sichilongo, the presentation has been very exciting and excellently done. Oh, Quimba, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate that feedback. Um, then you go on to say, by virtue of the interconnection in this global village, the call for transformation leadership is too necessary. I come from a corporate industry and my interactions the, with most ma multinational businesses operate is being on a copy and paste of the functionality of a particular business jurisdiction into a market like ours that, it's, that is simple in the way it does business. 
are we likely to see such organizations adjust strategies to tap into primitive but yet moderately profitable markets to do business? I think, uh, Quimba, it's actually going to have to happen because the question to, be, to ourselves is going to be how do we reach the unreached and how do we reach those we've reached with more and more business? The idea behind a profitable and a sustainable business is we don't want to be one hit wonders. I come from a generation where we used to buy records and tapes and you'd buy it because there was one great song, but the rest of it is rubbish. We called them one hit wonders and our poor artists would do the one great song and then disappear. What a business wants to do is to maximize business on the one customer, have the one customer repeating their, you know, their business choices with you and creating loyalty, if possible, even referring more, more customers. A good business also wants to be reaching those unreached customers. And for businesses in Africa, we then have to say, how do we reach those people that we haven't reached before and may not be able to reach either with technology or without technology? So it may require going to, yes, you call it primitive. I would say old tried and tested ways of doing business um, in these moderate, moderately profitable markets. Question from Evelyn, how does one become a good leader and what qualities is he or she supposed to possess? I think we touched on some of those uh, qualities uh, earlier, but let me talk about becoming a good leader. Sometimes being a good leader is being, you know, is choice. That means you're going to go out and acquire the skills and the knowledge. Um, you've made that choice. It's got to be deliberate. You're not going to become a good leader just by hoping you will become a good leader. But um, I dare say there's another quality to a good leader, which requires emotional intelligence. So being a good leader is not just about knowing technical, uh, being technically competent, being very knowledgeable. It's about managing people. Um, a technical and competent person is exactly that, a technical and competent person. They can produce a table to the highest quality. Being a good leader means being able to manage the teams around you so that you are achieving your results through other people. And doing so through other people is recognizing that people come with diversity, they come with skills, but they also come with needs at a personal and a non-personal level. And a good leader should have the emotional intelligence to be able to understand that and to you know, get people to contribute their strengths and help them manage their weak areas and feel a sense of acknowledgement and a sense of team. I should say a transformational leader cannot transform an organization alone. It's not just about role modeling, it's about deliberately getting teams engaged and being transformative as well. Steven Nyoni, I work with a company that offers wellness training for teams, but we've noticed the Zambian culture is still resistant to embracing these changes. How can we lead to transformation such that managers see that it's a necessity even in Zambia? Steven, I would say one organization at a time. I think that, um, Cognitive changes, skills and competence changes are always well recognized in organizations. And they tend to see uh, wellness programs and the other emotional intelligence and other skills like that as softer skills. In fact, as people grow in leadership, I would dare say that the softer skills become the more important skills. Why? Because you're de delivering results through other people and therefore being able to manage other people and achieve productivity through other people becomes more cardinal than whether you know how to switch on or switch off a computer. So when you start talking about wellness programs, this is probably a brilliant time if you, while you piggyback on the health issues of COVID to, to, to be engaging with organizations and letting them know that in fact, productivity will improve when people are able to manage their stress. When people are work, working in an un, unfamiliar environment in which they have to manage both children 
and themselves. Um, I know that uh, there's a number of um, uh, you know, counseling you know, organizations and they're growing, they're certainly growing. And a partnership with some of these is brilliant. Insurance companies, for example, I gave an example of an insurance broker who understands that life assurance is not something you're going to buy today when you have school fees to pay. You'll make that choice. But the person who's you know, paying for school fees may need to know on a regular basis that their blood pressure and their diabetes is being managed. And if they can do that, without having to walk into a medical facility. They can do that because the insurance company provides for it. That's a partnership. So Stephen, you might have to think about who do you partner with in order to offer your wellness and training programs so that it's a package deal for Zambian organizations. Um, from Galaxy, just says Galaxy J7, it's not a question really just want to thank you for the excellent presentation i so appreciate the feedback and i'm I, i'm glad it uh, you know it, it uh, worked for you fred mukanzo the lecture is so interesting <laughs> why can't i extend it to two days i will need Stephen yoni's wellness training as to how to do that over two days but thank you for that, uh, Fred. Um, I think we've come to the end of the question and answer session, and I just want to appreciate uh, your engagement uh, with this uh, webinar.